meaning, good evening. I'll just like to open by saying if anyone is finding gender neutral's bathrooms quite confusing, there's no hope for you. Um, <laughs> I will continue. Uh, my name is Rico Jacob Chase. My pronouns are he, him. I'm a director at Transaction UK CIC and a trustee and treasurer at LGBT Consortium. As was mentioned earlier, I recently was semi finalist in the TV show Make Me Prime Minister. And before you ask, no, I didn't want to be Prime Minister. They changed the name after I applied, and now I have this obnoxious headline on my CV. But to begin the proposition, or to continue rather, I would say the future is post-gender. I probably should first suggest the obvious. I'm a trans man who's taking it upon himself to move to the other end of the gender binary, and it might seem a bit hypocritical to profess that gender does not exist. I will, however, point out that living in today's society of high gender polarization, it's significantly easier for trans and non-binary people to go about their day-to-day -day lives whilst they have socially and or medically transitioned. Trans people account for 1% of the UK population and around about three quarters of, the, of our community socially transition and only half of us medically transition. But the main reason for this is actually societal pressures. Um, because once embarking on our journey of self-discovery, it's easier to walk through life as our true selves. But as a trans man who lives a proportion of my life as both genders, I'd like to offer you some interesting insight. I can safely confirm that there is a noticeable difference between the genders. And, but as we are talking about the future, let us turn our attention there. So what do we mean by the abolition of gender? Post-genderism is concerned is not concerned solely with the physical sex and its assumed traits. It's focused on the idea of eliminating or moving beyond gender identities. This does sound tad alarmist, but I would argue that it's actually achievable in the not so distant future. Firstly, there is a definitive difference between the existence of gender and it playing a divisive role in society. We are not discussing erasing gender, but redefining its role in our day-to-day -day lives. The moon may indeed exist on all of us equally, but most of us bear its little mind, unless, of course, you're a sailor, which you probably have something more important. But now back to being serious. I argue that a, it is a natural progression, and possibly even inevitable, that gender will become increasingly less relevant in future societies. As the feminist movement, the men's mental health movement, and the trans rights movement strive for equality. In short, on the long road of trans activism, there eventually will be a natural close. To take the analogy further, all equality laws have been passed. When hate crime is negligible, trans people are a respected member of society. In theory, there will be, any, there will be anything else to fight about, and ergo, it no longer will be topical. I guess the most obvious critique of my last comment would be that gender equality can still exist, but genders can still play a significant role in society. In short, segregation of genders, but all are treated equally. An excellent example of this would be single-sex spaces which either can be dictated by social conventions or actively enforced. For example, gender segregation is enforced in some religious gatherings, schools, and toilets. Whereas society dictates norms from some careers, the domestic household, and some sports. Therefore, I conclude it is inevitable that inequality will naturally creep into segregate as segregation exists. Another extreme example, separate by e but equal, for me, echoes the racist segregation passed in the US Supreme Court in 1896. With that in mind, even with the best intentions, segregation inevitably leads to inequality. So gender roles, what are we talking about here? If we were to argue that gender roles developed from naturally comparative advantage, such as the hunter-gathering society, it'd also be logical to suggest that as this comparative advantage were to become increasingly more redundant, as technology evolves, Therefore, so should gender roles. There aren't many bisons to spare on my morning commute home. So I would therefore argue that it, it is natural to divide. So therefore, I argue it is natural for this divide to become easy, increasingly inessential and in the future considered null. 
However, this example is heavily based on the assumption that all societies originate with role-based division, which is actually not the case. The Sand Tribe in South Africa that spanned territories of now Nam Nambia, Angola, Letho, Botswana, Zambia, and Zimbabwe are the oldest cultures on Earth. DNA tests prove that they are the direct descendants of the first Homo sapiens, but most interestingly, they don't actually have an official leader. And even more interestingly, they take decisions in the group where male and females are considered equal. It could be possible to say that in our pursuit of a perfect society, we may have assumed, in fact, that we are progressive. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but in countless examples where our ancestors have structured communities that are significantly more progressive, acceptive, and inclusive than the one we live in today. Now, colonialism, everyone's favorite topic. Colonialism creates a lasting impact on the society that we know today. Over half of the users of Gallup and LGBT hotline actually happen to be POC, and over half of the users of Stonewall Housing Homeless Shelter also happen to POC. So how did colonialism have a lasting impact on today? Well, it's actually relatively simple. If you have colonialist groups that project an idea of a perfect society on other groups, and it's sustained for several hundreds of years, the lasting impact is that those beliefs remain. So, as a result, people in India are actually removing laws that were put in during a colonialist era, and there's a lasting Im um, impact of homophobia and therefore transphobia in POC communities today. Hence, the disproportionate impact on our communities in this country. Now we have discussed the inclusive past eras of colonialism. Let's discuss countries that progress their stances on gender equality. Various countries have fought against abolition rights. They fought for women's rights, equal pay, and equalities, as my colleagues have tested to earlier. And I'll be a bit cheeky here. Scotland has also moved towards introducing misogyny as a hate crime. And I will mention Scotland is doing a lot in the progression of gender rights. I would like to expand on the topic of masculinity as a stereotypical, as it is these stereotypical attitudes that set in the behavior, um, they are these stereotypical sets of attitudes and ways of behaving that have negative impact on men and society as a whole. In the U UK, the Office of National Statistics reported that 74% of suicides were male in 2030. Some of the main concerns noted were inevitably to support their families, which is expected in the traditional household, where the male is the sole provider. The ONS noted that middle-aged men were more likely to be affected by economic adversity, alcoholism, and isolation, but also less likely to seek help. This tougher-than-nails attitude feeds into peer pressure subjected into men at a young age, such as boys don't cry, is embeds, techno techno um, embeds toxic masculinity into society. I would therefore argue that in a post-gender society, it would not only benefit women, non-binary people, trans men, it would also benefit cishet men. Uh, no, thank you. <clears throat> now to address the second point of hypocrisy. I stand here in the social construct of masculine attire, and I think it would be a good time to address the difference between gender identity and gender expression. Gender expression is a person's mannerisms and appearance. But as we know, RuPaul um, is a gay man, even though they do present as a woman. So therefore, I think it's important to recognize that in the overall brief. I would therefore like to discuss what I believe to be the realistic timescale for post-genderism. As we discussed, the feminist movement is striving for gender equality. The men's mental health movement is fighting against toxic masculinity. And trans wide movements is campaigning for legal equality. In my mind, we're all collectively addressing the legacy styles of colonialism and patriarchy and moving towards a more equitable society. If you like, returning to the ancient wisdoms of our pre-colonial societies. So when is the post-gender future? I would argue that this post-gender future is both attainable and more importantly, achievable within our lifetimes. The motion states that gender-neutral society is an ultimate goal of feminism, but I would argue it is a natural progression of society. Men should be able to cry. Women should be paid equally. Non-binary people do indeed exist, 
And within our lifetimes, I propose discussions around gender will become a redundant. Why? Because we finally will be deemed equal. <laughs>